Welcome along, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today to the SETI seminar series, uh, the last one for 2008, and uh, we hope you enjoy this one. We think it will be a, a very interesting topic today. We've got three fantastic speakers here to uh, talk as a panel on the nuclear weapons and, and space weapons. Uh, Pavel Podvig currently works at Stanford University. He's a graduate of uh, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and uh, the uh, Moscow Institute for World Economy and inter International Relations as well. He has a PhD in political science from that institution. And uh, he is uh, also uh, on, the, uh, on the board of directors for the Bulletin of uh, Atomic Scientists. And uh, he's uh, going to talk to us today about strategic na uh, arsenals around the world. Um, the man in the middle will be uh, familiar to everybody. Uh, Pete Warden is currently the director of NASA Ames, and he's uh, an acknowledged expert in, uh, in many fields, um, and particularly we're utilizing his skills in the uh, space weapons field. Uh, he has uh, <coughs> a, a background second to none in that area as a retired Brigadier General in the U.S. Air Force. Um, he's also a, uh, an ex-professor at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and uh, he's a graduate of the uh, uh, University of Michigan and University of Arizona. And uh, to complete our panel, we have Will Marshall. Will's a graduate of, of uh, Oxford University in the UK, where he did uh, work on uh, on uh, quantum quantum mechanics. And he is uh, also a familiar to those of you who are long-time observers of the SETI seminar series. He uh, spoke back in May, and he's also interested uh, and as a great advocate for uh, the de de-weaponization of space, as you'll hear in his in his talk today. So we're going to start off with Pavel. Uh, we'll, we'll have 15 minutes for each speaker, and then at the end, we're going to have 15 minutes of time for uh, questions and uh, discussion amongst the panel and also from the audience. Thanks very much, Pavel. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Adrian, uh, for inviting me. Thanks for uh, coming. Uh, what Adrian asked me to do, and I thought, uh, is to give an overview of the uh, nuclear forces of uh, around the world and the, the trends and status. And uh, I'm myself uh, more of a uh, Russian strategic forces uh, uh, student, sort of. I, I, I study Russia more than others, but I, I thought that, that I could try to do what I, what I can and uh, give you the idea of uh, where we are in terms of numbers and in terms of uh, policies and uh, uh, problems that uh, uh, all these nuclear forces uh, currently experience. Uh, these are uh, the uh, numbers, the estimates, and the best I uh, uh, plug like the uh, bulletin of the atomic sciences. This is a nuclear notebook, a re regular feature in the bulletin that is run by the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, uh, and they uh, provide uh, periodic estimates of the uh, arsenals. Uh, and this is where we are. Uh, Russia is currently is leading the pack with uh, more than uh, 5,000 uh, nuclear weapons deployed. And uh, the total number uh, is estimated to be about 14,000. Uh, the total number, and we, we know these numbers for Russia and the United States, or at least the estimates uh, for those, uh, that would include pretty much uh, everything that is sitting there in some kind of assembled uh, fashion. Uh, some of those uh, warheads in those 14,000s, uh, they are sitting there awaiting uh, dismantlement. They are waiting mm -hmm. to be uh, taken apart. Uh, so they are not really kind of a part of an operational force or reserve or anything like that, but still they, they are there in, in as, as physical uh, warheads. Uh, well, well, I'll go to the details of each, uh, each country uh, later. Uh, so uh, next, the United States is uh, the uh, sec second best in this uh, chart, uh, with more than 4,000 uh, nuclear war warheads still deployed operationally, and uh, about 11,000 warheads total. As you can see, the rest of the pack is much smaller. Uh, France is the uh, next contender with uh, just a 350 
uh, warheads, uh, China, uh, United Kingdom, uh, India, uh, Israel and Pakistan, they all are in, in, in this uh, kind of a, but still it's a, it's a substantial, uh, if you look at that, these are substantial numbers. We're talking about tens uh, of nuclear warheads. And uh, so they are getting there to the uh, five uh, sort of formally acknowledged uh, nuclear, nuclear uh, states. And uh, North Korea is the ninth uh, nuclear weapon state. There is uh, basically, it is believed that it has the material for a few uh, nuclear warheads, but uh, the best estimate that it does not have an operational operational uh, weapon uh, actually deployed. I'll start with the United States as a host country, although Russia is uh, the uh, the leading in, in terms of numbers. And this is the uh, what the United States has at the moment. Uh, there are uh, a little bit under uh, five, 500 Minutemen three missiles. These are ICBMs, and most of them are uh, carry uh, three warheads each, and some of them are uh, currently carry uh, just one. So you have the uh, uh, seven, seven, uh, 750 uh, warheads uh, total. Uh, the plan is to uh, reduce that force slowly to 450 ICBMs. That, that was the latest uh, word. And uh, it, it, it is possible that the new administration will uh, sort of, uh, uh, the new administration will actually, uh, will have to uh, do the nuclear posture review uh, in, uh, I think in 2009, uh, that's congressionally mandated. And that could change uh, the, the composition and that could change the numbers. But the results of the last uh, nuclear posture review uh, uh, say that the United States will keep uh, 450 uh, Minutemen uh, 3 missiles in silos. Submarine force, uh, the uh, future is easier to predict. I think the plan is uh, to keep 14 uh, Trident 2 submarines uh, in operation, and I don't think uh, that that would change dramatically with any kind of review. Uh, the United States traditionally keeps uh, emphasis on its uh, uh, SL, the submarine-based ballistic missiles, and that's the, if anything uh, will be left, that would be uh, the uh, sub 14 submarines. There are four more submarines, but they were converted uh, to other, other missions, to uh, cruise missiles. And there is a bomber force, uh, which includes uh, 72 active bombers, and uh, those are the old uh, B-52s. Uh, and uh, the newer uh, stealth uh, B-2 bombers. And these are, uh, I, I believe that B-52s are, are also dual, uh, dual capable. Uh, B-2s uh, certainly are dual capable. They can deliver. And they basically what they, uh, mostly what they do is that they, uh, they are involved in conventional missions. And uh, the United States uh, still has uh, some uh, tactical or non-strategic weapons, which are not uh, the kind of a, of the strategic kind uh, by definition. And these are uh, mostly uh, sea launch cruise missiles, uh, as, uh, but none of those uh, uh, are actually deployed right now. They are all uh, are sitting in storage on uh, on, on the shore. Uh, and uh, but there is a capability to redeploy them if necessary, although that would take uh, some time. Uh, there are some uh, bombs, uh, and the total uh, is the estimate is uh, that the total number of tactical uh, warheads is about 500, and about 100 of those are a, a outside of the United States. About 100 of those are deployed in Europe, and you're, and that's uh, that's actually a contentious point with with Russia in particular because uh, that's uh, the politics of uh, those weapons is uh, fairly fairly complex. So let's uh, go to Russia and the uh, as you can see this is a, a bit busier uh, chart uh, uh, because uh, Russia has a variety of systems and it is now in the in the transition from uh, kind of old force to new force. And uh, uh, the core of, if the United States relies primarily uh, on its uh, nuclear submarines, uh, Russia traditionally relies on its intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, now there are 415 uh, operational uh, missiles. Uh, the, uh, the number, the last number uh, that the rocket forces uh, cited, 96% uh, of those are in high state of alert. So they are ready to go in the few minute notice. 
Uh, but the composition, I mean, there are a number of old missiles uh, which are getting close to the end of their operational lives, uh, and the uh, SS-18, 19, and 25. And there, are, and Russia is working on on deployment and development of new missiles. With old missiles, it is interesting, and you uh, you, you 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 may appreciate that it, it turns out that these things uh, last forever. <laughs> the, just now, just a few days ago, uh, they they announced that they. Uh, extended the lifetime of the SS-19 missile to 33 years. So, and it's sitting there in the silo fueled with these, uh, with the uh, UDMH uh, fuel and the, uh, so that's, uh, that's quite an interesting fact. Uh, so, uh, the new missiles are uh, solid, solid propellant missiles, SS-27, uh, Topol M, the Russian name, and uh, RS-24 is another new missile, but this is a, just a multiple warhead version of, of uh, SS-27. There are quite a, be, quite a I mean, there are some submarines as well. Uh, as you see, the fleet is uh, uh, 13 uh, submarines. Uh, the, uh, however, uh, most of them are old, and there are uh, some uh, Delta III's and uh, Delta IV's. Uh, those are old Soviet-built submarines, and Delta III's are really old. They are re actually retiring. And Delta IVs are the six submarines will stay in uh, in force for uh, some time, maybe for about 10 or maybe even 15 years. And Russia is uh, uh, working on a new submarine. Uh, it is uh, it's not yet part of the force, but it is uh, there. It's getting there. It's uh, it's in the sea trials, and it is building a new uh, sea launch ballistic missile for that submarine, the Bulavan missile. Uh, it's uh, it's a new solid propellant uh, sea-based missile that will be deployed on those. Uh, Beret uh, submarines. Uh, that program, the Bulava development program, wasn't going very well. The missile just had uh, about uh, nine flight tests, and uh, I think only only one. They said the only the last one was the first that was completely successful. They had hitches or even failures in most of the tests. And the bomber force, uh, Russia keeps uh, two types of bombers: uh, the older uh, turboprop uh, 295s and the newer. Or they are also old. These are from the 80s. Uh, the uh, blackjacks, uh, the super, supersonic uh, heavy bombers, and and Russia is actually will be building uh, new new uh, new uh, bombers, new two one sixties. And uh, as you can see, Russia has a fairly substantial uh, non-strategic uh, arsenal, and the that again includes uh, sea launch cruise missile, uh, some bombs, some uh, anti-ballistic missile warheads. The estimate is that it's more than 2,000 warheads in that uh, arsenal. Uh, but uh, for as far as I can tell, the best estimate is that these are uh, these warheads are uh, tactical weapons are consolidated in uh, in what's called centralized storage sites. So they are not really there deployed with the with any with any troops. They are sitting sitting in a storage, although they are ready to to be deployed. Uh, the uh, just a final a final point on Russia. Uh, the the way it works in Russia, uh, what's happening, as I mentioned, Russia is building new missiles. Uh, it's building new submarines. It restarted the uh, bomber program. So uh, what 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 will happen in uh, in in about ten year time? Uh, Russia will actually uh, reach uh, the point where it its strategic force will consist of primarily of new systems. So and that that would be very difficult to uh, to reduce that 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 force uh, substantially because these are these are new missiles so there is a bit of resistance uh, in in Russia to to will be uh, quite a bit of resistance uh, uh, to doing that so we are uh, but at the same time uh, it's uh, this uh, modernization program is uh, going uh, ahead full speed. And uh, others are easier uh, in many ways. France is, uh, relies uh, primarily on submarines. Again, this is the, the, the choice for many, uh, many countries. Uh, and uh, it has four submarines uh, with uh, ballistic missiles. And uh, it is building a new, uh, new uh, ballistic missile that would be deployed on, on those submarines or newer submarines. But I think uh, in France, uh, the, and France also has some bombers. Uh, so it, it is a force about 300 warheads, and I think the, Fran the uh, France will ha have made the decision to keep it at that level, and it, it could probably 
uh, go a bit lower uh, in terms of, but only, I guess, in terms of kind of operational deployed warheads. And uh, it may at some point emulate Britain, which uh, which uh, did their interesting uh, thing with its arsenal. Britain has only submarines. They got rid of all the bombers and everything else. And uh, they have four uh, submarines. They use uh, Trident II. They use uh, U.S. missiles on those submarines. And uh, they, they lease them, actually, uh, as it turns out. Uh, but they declare that at any given time, there will be only one submarine on patrol uh, with 16 missiles and no more than 48 warheads. So that, that's the policy. That was a big review uh, a few years ago. And that's what the uh, the British, they decided that this is what they, uh, they, don't, they don't really need more. And that's, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a good step uh, toward uh, uh, actually uh, getting rid of, of uh, weapons. Uh, but as it happened, uh, the, uh, about two years ago, there was a big debate in, in the UK uh, whether they want to uh, keep uh, the Trident two force uh, because of the, they had to make this decision because whether they will be building a new submarine or not, and they had to start early. Uh, and uh, and, they, and people actually did talk about uh, an option of just eliminating all, getting rid of all nuclear warheads in Britain. Uh, but eventually the kind of a, a cautious, quote unquote, uh, faction prevailed and the decision was made to keep the Trident to force. Uh, but then again, it, the, so Britain is committed to an investment that will put it on, 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 the, on a track to keeping those uh, submarines for uh, about 30 years after uh, after these new submarines will will come into into service. Uh, China is the last of the uh, traditional uh, five permanent uh, five nuclear weapon states, and uh, uh, with China, uh, the interesting uh, story is that uh, China for a long time relied on a uh, really handful of uh, of uh, ICBMs. Uh, they had, uh, right now, the, the estimate is that they have 32 uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And, uh, but about 20 of them are, are uh, the old uh, DF-5. And these are old uh, liquid fuel uh, missiles they are, uh, that are stored in, uh, basically, in caves, in very you know, underground uh, complex. And they are not nearly, uh, they are not kept in any kind of a state of alert. Uh, some estimates said, uh, say that they are actually, uh, the warheads are stored separately. And, uh, uh, and, but China was very reasonably, reasonably happy about this, uh, this kind of a posture. They, uh, uh, now they are building new missiles. And, uh, uh, so they, these are DF-31 and uh, 31A. These are solid propellant missiles, uh, that are, uh, mobile and uh, they, we will probably see some of their position, but I don't think that they, it will go uh, much higher in terms of numbers. Uh, China is also building uh, submarines uh, that would carry ballistic missiles. Uh, right now it doesn't have any operational, but it is building two or three uh, new, uh, new submarines. And it also has uh, a number of non-strategic uh, weapons and uh, unlike uh, other countries, it has intermediate uh, range uh, missiles that can carry uh, uh, nuclear warheads. And, uh, you know, the United States and Russia are prohibited from having uh, these kind of weapons uh, because of the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty of uh, 8087. Uh, so Russia and the United States cannot have missiles with a range of more than 500 kilometers and less than 5,000 kilometers. That's the, uh, that's uh, bad. And finally, uh, uh, we have other other uh, nuclear uh, nuclear weapons weapon countries that are not kind of uh, recognized uh, by the non-proliferation treaty as the uh, nuclear weapons uh, weapon countries, uh, but uh, they still they have uh, nuclear weapons nonetheless, and they are uh, in some ways they are similar in uh, what they do. Uh, they uh, rely primarily on uh, aircraft uh, and uh, short and intermediate range missiles to uh, to as a primary means of delivery of their uh, warheads. Uh, none of them has uh, intercontinental range missiles, but and I think again, if you uh, but all of them, Israel has a reasonably intermediate range missile. Uh, it it 
it is not probably working on intercontinental range missiles. And India and Pakistan, they are working on there. They have uh, fairly active uh, missile programs uh, that they uh, go ahead with. And uh, finally, North Korea, again, uh, this is a kind of outlier here because they, they, do, uh, they do have uh, material for a weapon and for a few weapons, but they, uh, they probably do not have any deliverable weapons at, at this time. Let me stop here, and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, whether now or at the end. Or, okay, so we'll, okay, so we'll, mm -hmm, thank you. Okay, I just click through these things. This is one of those uh, Apple kind of yeah, products, or right? You, or you can use uh, just, uh, <laughs> the space. Okay, I'm very quickly going to go through uh, uh, space weapons, and I, and I need to have a disclaimer. NASA doesn't have any interest in space weapons, <clears throat> so I'm not speaking for NASA. Uh, in fact, uh, for the record, let me say I don't think we need any space weapons, uh, although I spent a good bit of my career working on them. So, uh, But that was a long time ago in a galaxy far away, so some of this information may be a bit dated. Uh, but uh, this was, Will, Will Marshall cut this talk down from about an hour, so hopefully I'll go through it pretty fast here. Uh, so, uh, but I have to see which charts you left in and which ones you left out. He did leave that one in. Uh, but uh, I really want to spend just a few minutes because, uh, the uh, and in fact, when I first met Will, we spent a lot of time arguing about what is a space weapon and space control. So let me kind of give you at least the current discussion. And I do want to point out that uh, President-elect is, uh, is uh, said that he wants to do some rather comprehensive uh, arms control on these. So I think this discussion will, will evolve over the next year or two. I'll talk a little bit about what... Uh, uh, what's going on today and, and some sort of dual use kinds of things. Uh, in the, uh, uh, about a decade ago, and, and slightly before, uh, the U.S. DOD, and particularly the Air Force, uh, got pretty aggressive and wrote a number of reports. Uh, this is uh, some, uh, there's the Air Force Strategic Master Plan, uh, and there's some U.S. National Space Policy. Uh, if you read these documents, they look pretty uh, uh, ambitious. They talk about space dominance and, and moving forward. Uh, whether that was advisable or not for the Air Force to do is an interesting point. Uh, I want to say again that, that, that these documents, you read them, you say, oh my goodness, there's going to be giant laser battle stations and so on in space and so on, but very little real stuff is being done. Uh, these were sort of sales and marketing pitches, quite frankly, uh, designed to appeal to people that are, won't be in the White House much longer. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the, 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 they are interesting. You ought to read them, though, because uh, they, they, they are a little scary. Uh, this obviously triggered a variety of, of, uh, of, of discussions, the, uh, uh, and particularly uh, probably in the middle of the, the decade, there was a lot of discussion when these things came out. So there were a lot of articles both in the U.S. and overseas that that said there was about to be a new uh, arms race in space. Uh, in fact, again, that's where I met Will, and we argued a lot about it. Uh, I think we're probably in 90% agreement now, so the uh, it took a lot of booze. <clears throat> but uh, uh, also, as a result of this, uh, Russia and China have been particularly uh, vehement about comprehensive space weapons ban, and there's been a lot of discussion about that. Now, I have to say again, I think, particularly in the case of China, that was was uh, somewhat two-faced based on actions the last year or two. Uh, one of the most interesting documents uh, is this annual space security index that uh, was originally sponsored by the Canadian Foreign Ministry and, and other groups. Uh, I think the last one is uh, 2007 uh, that, uh, or 2008. These are, these are very good documents, and I would commend them. Uh, and they, they, they give you a real idea of what's going on. Now, in the United States, there's a number of, of discussions, and this is where we really get into where do these things fit. Uh, in terms of, of military space, and I want to emphasize that the National Security Space Program is divided into two pieces. One is spy satellites, which are managed in an entirely different manner, although there's been attempts to try to merge them, and, uh, and military, uh, uh, 
But in the military side, most of what's done is in uh, Space Force enhancement. This is basically communications, navigation, surveillance systems, and so forth that are designed to enhance our armed forces' ability on the ground. Uh, and so that's where you'll see like 90-some percent of it. Counter space is where a lot of the argument is in, in the next two areas. And counter space really is divided into three areas. One is knowing what's going on in space. And, and I'll say that 90% of what is going on in counter space is in space situation awareness. Defensive counter space is how we keep uh, our critical national security satellites uh, from uh, from being destroyed. And, and by the way, again, I won't get into a lot of discussion, but my own personal advocacy on that is that we do what's called operationally responsive space. So if they're destroyed, you put them back up in a, a day, and then you go do something nasty to those who destroyed them in some other way. And uh, uh, But uh, there is a, a lot of attention now on, on survivability of, of, of critical U.S. systems. Uh, and offensive counter space is where generally is anti-satellite uh, space control now. Turns out most other countries don't have a lot of military space, so it's kind of a moot point. Uh, but there's a lot of discussion about that. Space force application is the other area that, that you'll, that there's a fair bit of discussion on. Uh, uh, you know, nuclear deterrence, of course, is one area, and that's the ICBMs as far as the space community is concerned. But missile defense uh, initially uh, was highly focused on space-based capabilities. It's not so much anymore. Uh, but it's still a controversial area. And one that is potentially of, of some interest is conventional strike. There are efforts ongoing in the Department of Defense to, to make a conventional ICBM. The concern, of course, there is how do you know when somebody fire, when you fire it at somebody that it didn't have a nuclear warhead uh, until it hits. And uh, so there's going to be a lot of controversy about these. There have been DOD programs to do it. There have been congressional uh, blockages of those. So it's, it's, it's an interesting area. Now, to get into the kind of weapons, and uh, of course the, the, the classic space weapon that, you know, anybody that watched uh, Star Trek and Star Wars and Space to Space, uh, that uh, directed energy is, was, is kind of the exciting area. It was a lot of discussion in the, in the, uh, uh, the missile defense, space-based missile defense era in the 1980s. Microwaves, lasers, and particle beams. Uh, the U.S. spent probably eight or ten billion dollars during the 80s in this area. Uh, interesting effort. I think it had a lot of political, both positive and, we would say, negative implications, but it certainly played some role in the ending of the Cold War. Kinetic energy interceptors uh, were much closer to deployment. These are basically a, a space-based missile that hits another uh, spacecraft. Uh, and then space-based missile defenses that use those technologies against missiles launched from the ground. Space to ground is an area that, that uh, as I said, uh, uh, the, there's, there's a lot of discussion, but to my knowledge, there's nothing more than studies going on in these. I mean, this was, again, the sort of, you know, Star Trek where, you know, the battle star is overhead and it fires a death ray and destroys a city or something. Uh, and the other one are kinetic impactors. And it turns out if you drop a, a 10 ton thing from you know deep in space by the time it hits the ground it has almost a kiloton of energy so these are sometimes called rods from god uh, because a, a well-directed uh, kinetic system could penetrate uh, maybe even tens of meters of concrete or rock uh, ground to space of course are the other end of things uh, uh, anti-satellite weapons that would be spaced uh, to uh, uh, or ground to space missiles and uh, directed energy weapons uh, the last one is one that, just to note, that, that a weapon that's long been discussed is that you ruin it for everybody. You just pump up the radiation belts and then satellites that uh, are just barely designed to tolerate the natural radiation. Uh, increased radiation in the Van Allen belts can cause most satellites to fail in, the, in a short order of time. Uh, the other big issue here and just is, is what isn't a space weapon. And uh, this has caused a lot of consternation. Uh, these are the are the force enhancement systems, the the, the uh, communication systems, uh, GPS systems, and so forth. Uh, information operations is another big area of being able to to uh, to use space uh, and space communications as a part of information operations. I could give you a whole other talk on that because one of my final jobs in the Air Force was briefly the Minister of Propaganda for the Defense Department. Uh, wasn't called that. But, uh, uh, and of course, you know, ICBMs are certainly, they, they fly through space. 
one of the key questions, and I, I don't really have any answer to this, but if the gun sight's in space but not the gun, is that a space weapon? And that's one of the things that, that is in any arms control discussion gets into there. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of interest in defensive counter space. Uh, there's, there's efforts of doing things like uh, uh, boxes that you could put on there that would, that would potentially stop deliberate jamming or warn of somebody approaching you or warn of inter interference from the ground. And there are people that believe in, you know, little escort nanosatellites and microsatellites, which is something Ames does do, by the way. Uh, frankly, most of these things, when they do cost analysis, don't make a lot of sense, but you'll see at least continued discussion. These things are, are being looked at now, and particularly in light of the Chinese uh, uh, experiment uh, here of uh, a year or so ago, uh, there's increased effort in these areas. Uh, one of the, the, the key issues, of course, is, is we do more and more efforts to do on-orbit servicing, and uh, there have been efforts, the, the uh, uh, DOD did something called the XSS-11, and NASA tried to do something a few years ago, but since they did it at Marshall, it didn't work. Uh, the, uh, uh, ended up impacting the target rather than rendezvousing nicely with it. So maybe, uh, maybe we did do space weapons then. But at uh, any rate, these things obviously are, you know, how do you tell that something that's designed to service or interact is a, is a, uh, uh, not a space weapon? Now, the, during the 60s to 80s, there was a lot of efforts. In fact, the, uh, uh, both the then Soviet Union and the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, deployed for time uh, missile systems that would be launched from the ground. Uh, these things, potentially when they impact, could produce a lot of debris that potentially causes more harm than good. Uh, both of these have been discontinued, but, uh, but again, it, it started a lot of the discussion. They were tested, yeah, and they were operational. Uh, the uh, recently, uh, this has kind of come back again. The uh, the Chinese did uh, a series of tests, culminating with the destruction of a weather satellite here about a year ago. Uh, this caused a lot of consternation in the uh, in the U.S. defense community. Uh, it also produced an awful lot of debris that that, that again exhibited the problem. Uh, the, the U.S. did something this year. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to believe that they did it for the reason they did it, but you know, I'll just state that, that they claimed there was a, a spy satellite that had a bunch of hydrazine on board that if we didn't shoot it down, it would come down and you know, kill millions of people or something, so they shot it down. Whether those were connected or not, those are for you to judge. Uh, but the problem is this did raise, again, that both China and the United States have an ability to remove a satellite in space. Uh, Electronic warfare, uh, this is something that is very hard to tell whether it's a space weapon or not. Uh, the U.S. does have something, it de briefly declared operational, a, a sort of a jamming system, counter communication system. Uh, the, it had some other systems designed to optically jam spy satellites. Uh, those were terminated by the U.S. Congress. Uh, there have been numerous instances of, of jamming not by the United States. In fact, Indonesia and Tonga had a satellite war where they used various communications dishes to jam the other one's uh, satellites. Uh, and non-state actors, the Falun Gong seized control of some Chinese communication satellites. So it was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting effort. So at this point, that's another area to keep. Uh, uh, I don't want to talk a lot about missile defense, but uh, other than pointing out that a missile defense system clearly has some space weapons capabilities. Uh, a few years ago, there was something called the N-Fire, which was uh, designed to be kind of a surveillance system, but also initially was supposed to be able to, uh, uh, in principle, impact something. And then they said it wasn't, but they still called the, the vehicle a kill vehicle. Uh, by the way, this vehicle now sits over at Ames. We are taking it apart and using it for lunar exploration. Will's been quite excited about that. That it's uh, you know it's the swords to plowshares. Uh, force application again, uh, lasers. There was a lot of effort uh, uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, we have some large facilities. Arguably, uh, the the Russians launched something. Uh, if you talk to people like Roald Sagdeev, he says it actually was a laser, and uh, uh, that uh, Gorbachev ordered them not to turn it on. 
uh, this again is one of the great mysteries. There's a lot of articles about it. I don't, you might have some some thoughts on that. So, but uh, uh, the rods from God again. I don't want to get into a lot of effort other than saying there's a lot of hypersonic vehicle development that that is certainly relevant to high speed kinetic impact uh, that's going on a number of places. Uh, high altitude nuclear burst. Uh, when we did test in the atmosphere, as did the, the Soviet Union, uh, inadvertently knocked out a whole bunch of satellites. So we learned that this is a bad thing. Uh, there's a fair bit of effort how to mitigate those. Uh, the, uh, so uh, there's actually a facility in Alaska that was designed as a way to, if you could diddle with the, with the uh, magnetic field lines, you could help drain the poison from the wound, if you will, by accelerating the natural processes to, to cause decay of, of pumped radiation belts. Uh, these are just sort of my points kind of in closing, uh, I think there's a lot of rhetoric. Uh, I don't know how much of it is, is warranted. Uh, I think that the space weapon zealots, at least in the, in the last six or eight years, talked too much and did nothing. And I think they scared the animals, if you will. Uh, and But also, I think some of the alarmists enjoyed being scared. There's a small cottage industry in Washington, D.C. of a few people that that, that collect money and, and, and write things on this. So, again, I don't know whether this is a, a big issue or not. Uh, space control is clearly a subset of a lot of other security uh, effort, efforts. Uh, I don't think that weapons, when you go through them in space, make any cost-effective sense. And, I mean, that's, a, again, a topic for a couple hours discussion uh, or some over a beer. But uh, I, I am not an advocate of, of really any of these things other than in space situation awareness and uh, in some defensive efforts. Uh, in fact, the U.S. is certainly not doing very much in this. I'd suggest that if you add it all together and what would be called a space weapon, you're in the you know, tens of millions of dollars of mostly research money, uh, although that does lead back to the first one. Uh, there's a lot of nations developing dual-use capabilities uh, to do things in space that could be used as space weapons. And I, and I think there's a big need in this area for, for rational dialogue, and I think we're going to see that with the new administration. Uh, so it's a, it'll be an interesting discussion. Dr. Marshall. Um, I thought it was interesting that my slides are black and his are white, and sort of historically it's been the other way around. Um, so... We made progress. <laughs> both sides, yeah. So uh, I, I just wanted to um, um, uh, talk a little bit uh, 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 about ways forward mainly, um, uh, rather than dwell on the discussion of space weapons per se, talk about what are constructive ways forward, which I, was something I've been thinking a lot about because I spent a lot of years uh, um, trying to argue with people that were advocating space weapons as opposed to trying and thinking about alternatives. And then I decided that it might be useful to try and think of alternatives that address some of the genuine security concerns that they were that were motivating the discussions behind space weapons, um, and uh, so let me just talk about some of the the initial motivations, and then some of the ways forward that I have in mind, and a brief discussion about space weapons and conclusions. So, um, the first thing that, that that is not often known in the public and even in the space industry on the civil side is just how important space is for the military in general these days. And, and one only needs to think about Iraq to have a very quick understanding of how important space is. Not only was it involved, of course, in the decision to go in, both in reconnaissance sense and signals intelligence, um, whether or not that was the right decision or not, one can argue about. But it's certainly the case that satellite intelligence was used as a central part of the basis of deciding to go in or not. Um, the entire military operation was conducted from Florida, um, which is, you know, not possible, of course, without communication satellites. And then um, everything was, you know, every personnel, tank, ship, plane, etc., and even missiles were guided with GPS. And, and so you know, they're, they're, they're a central part of the nervous system of modern military. And arguably, that doesn't even touch on the most important military space capability, which is early warning of missile attack. Um, because this didn't relate to that, so uh, satellites provide the first warning of uh, nuclear attack on a uh, on the U.S. and other countries. Russia has a system, for example. 
Um, and so the basic point is that space set systems are very important to U.S. security and other nations' security. It's growing in importance. The U.S. and Russia are the big shareholders in that, if you like, but uh, increasingly many other states are figuring out that it's useful to use space for military purposes, and I'm mainly talking about military purposes that are passive, like um, transparent uh, 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 see, uh, th uh, things like spy satellites and communication satellites and navigation systems and so forth, because it enhances their military as well as their civil uh, in a society in an economic sense. So, um, and, the, and, the, and a significant problem with, with, with this is that satellites are very vulnerable to attack. And this comes from the, the very simple starting point of the technological asymmetry associated with space. So satellites are very easy to see and they're very predictable in terms of their position. And they're easy to see. You can literally go outside with a telescope. I mean, with the naked eye, you can see them. But with a telescope and a stopwatch, you can, you can pinpoint exactly where as they pass a star and determine their orbit to quite good precision. So, I mean, compared with other military domains, it's incredibly transparent. Everyone can see whose satellites are up there, despite NOAA's efforts to pretend that some of its satellites aren't in its catalogue and therefore don't exist, everyone can see them. You have amateur s satellite watchers who regularly predict the positions of NRO totally classified, don't exist satellites. So it's, it's a very ironic, it's a very transparent domain. Um, but because the, the, they're very visible and very predictable, they're, they're very easy to target. Um, and so that's why uh, space uh, ground-based anti-satellite systems and space-based weapons have, to some extent, uh, come to the fore. This in combination with the fact that they're very important for the military has driven people to think, oh my god, s satellites are important and they're vulnerable. We better put weapon systems into space to stop that. Uh, not, and the sort of irony is that weapon systems don't advance the security at all of these satellite systems, but, but um, nevertheless that is part of the motivation. And so addressing that motivation is, um, is an important thing. So. Um, in this book, The Space Security Index, we talk about that sort of definition of space security. And I talk about space security mainly because it's a broader concept than uh, um, just about space weapons. Uh, you know, one is interested in securing the space environment so that for every, everyone's use. And uh, this is a real, uh, really a note that I make because I, I make these sort of presentations to generals and, and people in the Pentagon and policymakers and stuff. And, they, and generally, it seems to me that people in charge of these discussions don't seem to know Kepler's laws and the rocket equation, which are so fundamental to having a discussion about this that I can't even begin to explain how stupid it is that th th there are people. Uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, then. Um, so, so what are some of these vulnerabilities? Uh, uh, so I, I sort of try to list these in order of it, 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 of, of most likely at the top and least likely at the bottom. So it's very easy to jam. and uh, 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 Basically, jamming of satellites happens quite regularly, both inadvertently and, and purposefully, um, because it can be done with very simple equipment on the ground, doesn't need any space-based systems at all. Physical attacks on ground stations are the next easiest thing. Lobbying a, lobbying a bomb over a ground station, you know, onto a little ground station is very simple because they're on the ground and easy to access. Dazzling and blinding of satellites is remarkably simple. Um, in fact, you can dazzle a satellite with a laser pointer like this if you could possibly pin it exactly onto the uh, place that the satellite is for, for optical reconnaissance satellites. The amount of light that you need from the ground is very low, and that, what that would do is it wouldn't you know, blow up the satellite or anything, but it would mean that it couldn't see this region for that t point in time. You'd have to have good pointing accuracy, and not, my hand wouldn't do but, um, but, I mean, in principle, it's a very low-power system that one needs for that. Um, uh, and then radio frequency uh, uh, weapons uh, uh, can be used uh, to... to, to uh, I should first say, blinding really involves when you, you, when you burn the sensors, and that requires a bit more energy than in this. But not much, actually, funnily enough, um, because they have these big collecting areas focusing all this light onto one small little CCD array, and so, of course, you don't need much energy to, uh, to burn it. So um, free, uh, uh, radio frequency weapons are uh, uh, so basically uh, uh, the same in the radio band, and heat-to-kill weapons are basically you heat things up via high-powered microwaves, for example. 
pellet cloud attack. So, so all of these things um, have not involved doing anything in space, uh, but the, yet they cause vulnerabilities for those satellite objects. I mean, you didn't have to send anything anywhere. And then, and then these ones start to involve something into space. So pellet cloud attacks means you, you throw a, 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 a pellet of small metal objects into orbit and, and they slowly hit other space objects. That's very simple with, a, with all you need is a, 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 a LEO capability or even a suborbital capability. Attacks on space by microsatellites, heat to kill anti-satellite weapons. We've hit to kill anti-satellite weapons we've talked about. That's what the Chinese and the US recently did. I call it an anti-satellite weapon because uh, that's what it is. Um, they call them tests and actions which is very odd to me. I mean, I call it an anti-satellite weapon because anti-satellite stands for anti-satellite, and that's what they did. Um, High-altitude nuclear detonations is sort of the worst thing you can do, um, and that's, again, that was done, um, but not many people have the capability because you both need a, a space launch capability and a nuclear weapon, and that quickly rounds it down to only a few states. So, um, and this is another problem, and that's the debris. That's just the, that's just the stuff we know exactly where it is, by the way. That's the stuff over 10 centimeters in size, um, of which they amount about 12,000 objects. There's about 30 million pieces that we estimate in total of man-made debris. Uh, most of it's smaller than 10 centimeters in size. Um, we track the stuff that's bigger than 10 centimeters because we can see it with ground-based radars, but um, we can't see the smaller stuff, and yet it's only things above, above about a millimeter or a few millimeters that can start have damage on space objects. A lot of this space debris was caused by all of the launches that happened to date, um, about two-thirds or three-quarters of which were Russian launches, and lots of, but, but a lot of it was caused by breakups and anti-satellite events in history. And so we can't really carry on with that. Um, and so I've already described this, but... Uh, this Chinese ASAT event really made matters a lot worse. Although it only launched, it created about 3,000 bits of debris, it, it considerably increased, according to our analysis, the conjunction rate. So the, because it goes up with n squared, uh, with, uh, no, it, it doesn't go up with n. And uh, so you only need to add a bit more debris, and it gets considerably worse, your conjunction probability. Uh, the US ASAT is less debris, but it's still bloody stupid. Um, uh, ways forward. Um, let me get on to that. I, I, I think one has to really break it into two aspects, technical and diplomatic. This is much more controversial than this, generally, um, uh, um, because some people don't believe law does anything. And uh, I, I say to them, well, uh, aren't you glad there's a, 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 a law banning murder? And, you know, you know it's, 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 it's a very philosophical thing. Some people you know, like law, other people don't. Um, but anyway, technical measures are much more... Um, appealing to most, and, and so it's interesting, some things that we, we've talked about, protection of satellites, a lot of people agree that we should protect our satellites more, um, space situation awareness, that means sensing where everything is, that's a really good idea, especially sensing smaller things so that we can see the potential for collisions even with these smaller objects, that's very important, um, and it's good that if other countries do this, not just the US and Russia, which have systems for this, because it's, it's a transparency building thing. It, everyone knows where everyone is, and it builds trust. Operationally responsive space is something that has recently caught on a lot in the U.S. military. This is being able to launch a satellite quickly if one of them is taken up, um, which, is, which is good because uh, uh, that means that you're not so worried about people taking things out. However, I argue that there's uh, a couple of other things you really need, and particularly this fourth one, which is about... Um, if you really want to deter attacks on satellite assets, what you don't want is a few big satellites that are easy to see and you know where they, everyone knows where they are, and if you take out one, the system goes down. That's the situation we currently prevail in for most satellite systems that the U.S. has. You know, for example, there's four to six big spy satellites, and, and you take out one and there's a big hole. Um, or there's, there's uh, 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 four to five um, uh, early warning satellites against missile attack, and you take out one or two, and there's a big hole over a region where you can't see the nuclear attack anymore. Um, what I think that a big part of the future is about uh, sort of having multi-tiered satellite constellations, lots of little satellites replacing those few big ones, so that they're all over the place, and if so, there's no incentive to take out a satellite like the Chinese did of their own, because 
if you took out one of these small satellites, the system wouldn't die. I mean, the system remains there. Whereas if you take out a satellite right now, not only is it easier because they're bigger and fewer, uh, it, it actually significantly affects and deteriorates the system. So I actually wrote a paper about how um, one can design, redesign the US military satellite architecture in a way that is much less vulnerable to attack by having these multi-tiered architecture of little satellites everywhere. And again, all on the, on the passive side, I'm talking about space traffic management is another thing. So we're coming up to a point where there's, a, you know, it's, we in space are alike. We were in the driving realm, say, in 1920 or something. People hadn't bothered to put rules on the road about driving on the left or the right and stuff, because that was fine, because there were so few people, it didn't make any difference. I mean, you didn't have to decide whether to drive on the right or the left. No one cared. And then at some point, traffic becomes sufficiently dense that you have to decide. It's in everyone's interest, even, you know, you, you, even those that really want to swerve around. You know, it makes it everyone's interest to decide, oh, okay, we're going to drive on the left or we're going to drive on the right. And obviously, it should be the left, by the way. And uh, so, so, you know, eventually, we're getting to that point in space traffic. And uh, so w we, we need to define rules of how to do that. Um, and, and, and utilize them. And, and, uh, and there was an International Space University uh, uh, project on, on designing a first sort of design of such a system, and, and I think that's kind of cool. Um, so on the diplomatic side, we can have treaties um, uh, and sort of more, less tangible things like confidence building measures. I think that really we need to go towards treaties. In particular, one needs to just prohibit straight out um, anti-satellite events and, and other kinetic kill events in space. Um, the funny thing is that uh, uh, people talk about, oh, it's difficult to define these things and it's, it's difficult to verify. Actually, it's incredibly easy to verify um, sa satellite, um, blo thing, uh, satellites blowing up in space. Not only can you tell who did it, because we have early warning systems to determine who shot the missile, um, but you can determine exactly when it had by backtracking all the debris to its origin point where, where the explosion happened. And so you can tell all sorts of in, in information about the event. It, there's no question of wh who did it or, uh, or what have you. It, it's, it's, it's very transparent. And so a treaty has a good basis there because we can easily say, hey, it was you guys, pay up in whatever manner the, the treaty. At the minute, the irony of what the Chinese and the Americans did in the last two years in blowing our satellite is that it's legal. And then the, the, the Americans try to lambast the Chinese for blowing up the satellite, but actually there's no way they can because it's actually legal what they did. And so stupid because, of course, that shouldn't be legal. And if it was illegal, then we would be able to punish that sort of action. Um, so and I, th I think that's very important. Um, and uh, confidence-building measures, you know, is basically... Um, le less, less concrete versions of this. Um, so uh, basically, this was just, I, I won't go through this, but we, 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 I basically designed a first cut at what a system like this microsatellite constellation architecture would look like for each one of the current military space systems of the US. And the same is sort of applicable to other countries, um, of course. It doesn't make any difference. These are just technologies. The basic point is to have the same capabilities but less vulnerability to attack using existing technologies. I also happen to think that it can be done for a lower cost uh, than because the US military is very much in the billion dollar satellite sort of model. Um, uh, those are the sort of five main functions of military satellites that I was trying to recreate, military and intelligence satellites. Um, but, and here's an example of one for early warning satellites. We would have a MEO and GEO tier rather than the current just GEO tier. We'd have more of them, split them up. Um, we'd split up the nuclear detonation uh, function from the, from the uh, missile tracking function, for example, just to be able to disperse the capabilities. Uh, anyway, you can read the paper if you're interested. And this is the space traffic management system that International Space University uh, came up with, basically a conjunction analysis and maneuver systems for collision avoidance, generalized collision avoidance. Believe it or not, that's not done right now. Um, uh, for a few things it is, like the shuttle and the space station and something, we, we look in advance to see if it will hit us another object, and then maneuver if necessary. But for most satellites, most of the time, we just let them go. Um, because the chances are kind of small, but the problem is when that happens, it causes much more debris, and then we have a bigger problem to deal with, and so one has to check it at some point. Um, uh, space weapons, I, I think if anyone does a, cost, a serious cost-benefit analysis, 
comparable with other alternatives. Or, in fact, I think most space weapons decrease U.S. security, not increase them. In fact, I've never come across a space weapon that increases US, U.S. security. I think they all decrease it because they, the U.S. has the most to lose from a space war game in general because it's the most dependent on satellite systems. I don't think provoking uh, space uh, missile stuff is, is a bad idea. But anyway, I mean, we, we don't need to go into that. That's a long debate, but... Um, uh, yeah, so this is just an example of how, it, for one of the weapons. So let me just conclude. Uh, so I, I started by saying that satellites are very important, and yet they're vulnerable. That's one of the motivations why people think about space weapon systems. I think there's ways forward um, that need more focus and attention, um, both technical and diplomatic. I think finally, with the dying out of this idiotic administration, we will see this one be revived. I mean, basically the entire rest of the world wants to do, go into this discussion, but the US has been blocking it for the last uh, 12 years. I think that's absolutely against US security interests. But also the technical approach, I, I think, will be developed further too. And in my analysis, space weapons aren't part of the discussion at all. They're just stupid. Um, I, finally, I just left some resources in, in case people uh, want some uh, further information on this. All right, uh, just to kick off uh, some discussion, I was wondering if each of the panelists could perhaps uh, just say a couple of words about uh, the uh, greatest changes that you see coming with the new administration. President-elect seems to favor uh, reducing nuclear weapons, uh, he, yet he just he's just uh, reinstated a Secretary of State who has shown some interest in developing new nuclear weapons. Perhaps you could each have a couple of words on that. Well, I think the hopes are pretty high uh, uh, as far as expectations are, are concerned. Uh, there, in, there, there is a... Uh, we will certainly see uh, some new arms control dialogue with, with Russia on uh, the, we, we have the arms control agreement start one that expires in uh, December 2009 and there, there has been actually the Bush administration started some activity uh, making sure that there is a follow on agreement and there seem, seems to be a consensus that there should be something done. Uh, so, and uh, I think the new administration is committed to doing that. So at least some, uh, we, we will see some progress. There, there, are, there is, it is possible that actually uh, the, the new administration will do a much uh, more serious overview of the policies. And uh, as I mentioned, the nuclear posture review is coming up. Uh, but independent of that, I think Barack Obama is on record saying that he would support the goal of eliminating nuclear weapons. And uh, we may see actually, I, I think that it, the time is good for some dramatic changes in the U.S. force. It would be difficult, but not impossible. Well, I think the uh, on the space side, uh, uh, you know, the, the time for doing things is early in administration before you get tied up in all sorts of other things. Uh, I, I suspect that uh, uh, we, we've already seen a bit of a, uh, you know, the change in, in uh, uh, the president-elect's view on civil space. I mean, he's talked a lot about that. He's talked about uh, national security space. He has made statements in his campaign about supporting operationally responsive space. He's also talked about uh, doing something about space weapons. So I would anticipate this is going to be fairly high on their agenda. You know, you know the interesting thing is that that uh, uh, space is a topic that you can talk to most people about, whether it's civil or military. And it's uh, often if you can't agree on, you know, sort of, sort of harder things like economics, you can go do something with space. Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, about six months ago, I was in Korea and uh, was at a conference on IT and the uh, uh, they sort of escorted me to the front table, and I uh, uh, there was I, I could tell it was sort of a high level thing because they had Sumner Redstone, who's a, the head of Viacom. And by the way, if anybody know, ever met him, he is an asshole. Uh, <laughs> they, I think I said that, uh, but uh, he uh, 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 there was a tag at the end of the table that said President. And I assumed it was the president of the of the company that was sponsoring this, and said it was President of Korea that walked in and. 
and uh, you know he came over to me and 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 you know introduced himself and I was, yeah I know who you are sir <laughs> and, but it was uh, uh, he did say he said I'm going to see your president pretty soon and I really want to talk to him about uh, uh, cooperation in space and in fact they've signed an agreement with NASA and I think they're going to do a lot to, and as these things go on I could see the new president will find that that not just civil but also national security space and security arrangements uh, will be an area that will pay big dividends in much broader than just uh, you know the, the specific space effort so I look for seeing some very interesting things in the next couple of years and uh, you know whether you're in civil or military space and I think some of the things Will talks about will be very seriously considered I, I don't really know much about the nuclear stuff but um, I just found this this on the bummer um, uh, website uh, uh, the Obama space policy was it, it, it made a specific statement um, um, know, that naughty website yeah, yeah thanks yeah Barack Obama does not support the stationing of any weapons in space he believes the international community must address the issues of space weaponization head-on and enter into serious dialogue with Russia and China and other nations to stop this slow slide into a new battlefield <laughs> Is there any uh, proposals or thoughts underway for getting rid of the debris that's already there? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, th there are certainly thoughts. Uh, the, most of them are very expensive, and uh, uh, sometimes they cause more trouble than, the, than they do. But in the past, we've looked at things like, uh, you know, Going up with and capturing things and bringing them down, but that's very, very expensive in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, systems and fuel and so forth. Uh, the, the areas we're most worried about now is actually geosynchronous, which makes it very, very hard. Uh, the other area, of course, in very low Earth orbit, it cleans itself over time, although there's a slow rain of things from above. Uh, the other thing that was looked at and actually had some promise was to use large lasers. And you actually would then fire at them and ablate material off, and it would slowly uh, come back and, and, the, and it would decelerate them as they come back in the atmosphere. Now, the problem with that one is it's indistinguishable from a laser weapon. And uh, uh, indeed, many of the zealots for that were uh, laser weapons people. <laughs> and so, so I, it, it's a tough problem. I think that most of the conclusion is that, that it's in preventive. Activities, and of course, we do have a, uh, a requirement now, which NASA enforces pretty vigorously, of of uh, being able to deorbit things. And in fact, that's added a significant cost. I know the Department of Defense objected to that very strongly. Uh, I wrote the white papers on that, by the way. Uh, but it's uh, just because it adds cost. So, uh, but I think those are things that are going to be part and parcel of this this uh, uh, stuff that Will talked about uh, about traffic. Um, question for you, Pete. You said um, that you were not an advocate of space weapons now, um, but that you worked on them in the past. So I wondered if you, um, if you changed your mind, what caused you to change your mind, and was it that the um, that the thought of military input into space was one of the best ways to get funding for it? Well, there are certainly lots of agendas. Uh, the, the primary thing is, I mean, again, I spent much of my life and national security issues, uh, in the context of the Cold War, uh, space weapons were a much different situation. Uh, and this is a highly arguable, but uh, all, all security is perception. And uh, that, you know, and I was centrally involved in setting up the missile defense program, and uh, I believe that the, the intent, which actually did accomplish much of that, was to change the game enough to, to give us abilities to do, new, you know, to, de to defuse the situation through other means. Uh, the threat of space weapons clearly got the attention of the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, I, w I spent time in Geneva and spent a fair bit of time in discussions with the, with the Soviets. And I'm convinced that the, in that period, the US apparent commitment to do space weapons, coupled with our success in Apollo, was a key consideration in coming to an accommodation. Now, again, that's a highly arguable effort, and there's a lot of, you know, we could sit down for hours in that. But in that sense, I strongly supported the effort to develop uh, those things, and I think that was a positive issue. But the Cold War is over. We're back in a multipolar 
situation. So today, I don't see a lot of, uh, of, of benefit from that. We aren't confronted with a world at a hair trigger where you need to get out of that. I, I think now, as Will pointed out, uh, space is a way to enhance security through a lot of other things. And then in that context, it's a uh, uh, space weapons are probably unhelpful. And I, and I really can't see very many ways that they, they do anything for us. Finally, I guess, uh, you know, and this is the one area that I do disagree with Will on. I think one be, needs to be very careful about signing bans on things for all time because sometimes you find that, you know, what you banned is what you might really need. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, all of this can be overtaken. But supposing you banned all nuclear weapons, and then somebody said there's a five kilometer meet or asteroid coming at us, and you know uh, the only way we could have done it is to use a nuclear device against it, or a physics package to use a euphemism. And uh, you know maybe you wished you hadn't done that. So it's just I think that there are lots of things short of of all out bans that 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 do make sense and that need to be looked at. And I'm, and I'm sure that the administration will look very seriously at those. May to add quickly to, to your point about the uh, space weapons work in the, in the, in the Cold War. And I actually, I, I, I would say it's, it was exactly the opposite. And the fact that the U.S. Uh, space, I mean, space weapon program, the SDI program had on the Soviet Union was actually to uh, empower uh, people in the, in, in the Soviet Union who worked on their space weapons, and the, you showed this uh, slide with the, uh, uh, and the, and that that was, but that was only because of uh, that's yeah. highly argued. Yeah, it is, it is highly, but no, it, it is actually there. There are documents now and uh, the archival stuff that actually shows very clearly that that was uh, not very helpful in actually in the Cold War. No, that no, 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 no. That no. That's that's exactly that's exactly the opposite way. Uh, that's uh, it, it, they they looked at that the, those things before it happened, and the uh, the this uh, when when it, when this whole thing started, uh, actually it made it much more difficult for uh, for the Soviet Union to come to accommodation. Well, I studied this stuff. Believe well, me, I, uh, no, I know, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the fact of the matter is, we did come to an accommodation. We did end the Cold War. And, uh, you know, I'm convinced that part of it was Reagan's refusal to give it up at Reykjavik, and that opened some new channels. It, it, this is, it, and we have our own sources and our own information. Yes, indeed, they tried to compete with us and lost. So it was a, it was, that's an exciting, interesting discussion. I mean, I have, you know, I've written a book on it as well, if you want to read it. And uh, uh, so, you know, but... That, that was then. This is now, and there's a different situation now, so I think we're probably in pretty good agreement. No, it's a different situation. So, Pete, you started your talk with a bunch of definitions, and Will, you alluded to the diplomatic problems in the past. I mean, one of the things that we need to define is space, and as I understand it, we've been sitting over there in Vienna for more than a decade arguing about what space is in order that no one can have anything to say about what our assets are there. Are we likely to see a change in that attitude along with everything else? It seems like it's a first step for the next administration. Uh, yeah, but space is still not defined in the context of uh, the international legal system. Um, but on the other hand, there's a very strong consensus that it's, it's basically 100 kilometers and up, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be orbital. This is just a space definition. But um, that's not to say everyone agrees with that. And yeah, it would be useful as a starting point. Um, part of the problem with these ASATs is that it's very much altitude dependent. I mean, and, and you know, it makes a huge difference whether it happens at 80 kilometers or 800 kilometers. And so, yeah, I, I, I think the point is very important. And uh, no, it hasn't been addressed. But I mean, you know, there has been belligerence on the part of the US in the system. I mean, I, I've been to Geneva through these discussions, I've been to Vienna through these discussions, and they are. You know, it, it, it's really, there's no other word for it. It's the U.S. and the entire rest of the world. You know, it's literally 167 votes in the GA4 of resolution to, to go forward with a discussion on space uh, security and space weapons and one against. And, you know, that's the U.S. And, I mean, that boggles my mind that the U.S. is, like, you know, so belligerent on the issue. But I think that's just about a change.
Uh, I have a short question for Dr. Podvik. Uh, you said that the Chinese started out with ICBMs, uh, but that would have been at a time when their main enemy was the Soviet Union. Why would they have wanted ICBMs at the time when their main enemy was close by? No, I, well, uh, I I think that still to uh, from I mean, if you if you want to uh, go from China to uh, to Moscow, you still need a a, a fairly uh, I'm not sure that you need ICBM, but I think it's uh, when when you start doing that. I mean, at some point you do need the three. I mean, two-stage uh, large uh, missile, and you may as well just go for an ICBM. And they they did keep the United States in mind <laughs> as well. I think so. That that was I think that was political, but as well the engineering decision. Yeah, I have a question back here. Uh, can you explain the rationale for the number of uh, of the missiles that just uh, seems like uh, uh, countries other than U.S. and, and the so former Soviet Union ha have the appropriate uh, quantitative strategy for for self-defense and even offensive capabilities. Why the order of magnitude difference? And uh, that, that's one question. Uh, the other question, out of curiosity, is who is leasing the submarines to 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 the British? And uh, third, last question is. Uh, if you believe that uh, taking out satellites is is uh, so easily done, uh, why didn't the Iraqis prepare for that during the war? Okay. Let, let, let me on on the on the uh, on the numbers. Uh, the the only reason uh, the, the, these numbers are that high is that uh, because that's what we did during the Cold War, and and if you if you look at the uh, kind of a uh, at the uh, arguments that people made in favor of those numbers, uh, you could say that, uh, and, and inside they they didn't make make much sense. In fact, and and it was. Uh, I want to answer this, but that's not correct. It's, it's different, different, there different there were there were it's it was well it was a yeah it was a complex process and certainly uh, and certainly people were making arguments and the uh, rational and uh, irrational as well. Quite rational strategy. It's not useful for destruction. Well, that's which wasn't the U.S. or Soviet strategy. It was a nuclear war fighting strategy. Which required Basically, they were trying to take up all the different bases. So yes, they, they, they wanted to be able to. That was certainly one of yeah. That was certainly one of the. Uh, that was, that was one, our stated strategy. Which one of the yeah. Yeah, that, one of the myths of the Cold War. Yeah, that that was certainly one of the ideas. But there were there were other people uh, who were arguing other other ways. Uh, so so that's uh, but but. The, the, the bottom line, I think, at this point, uh, there it, it doesn't doesn't really uh, does, doesn't really make much sense to to keep those huge arsenals uh, around. Uh, on, on on submarines, uh, I think uh, the the British they have their own submarines. They just uh, they lease the uh, the missiles, and, and and those are those are actually U.S. missiles, and they are they are actually U.S. property, as far as I can tell. And they so, so the, the British have their own submarines and the two German warheads. But yeah, but they the use the missile. Same missile that the US used on their side. And <laughs> yeah, well, well, maybe I can. Uh, not that it, all these things make sense, but the the issue was the the uh, the, the the Trident missiles. Are U.S. manufactured missiles, and the, the point is, is that various agreements we don't sell strategic things to other people. In, in fact, there are even agreements that we don't do that. So you can lease them, uh, which is a different issue. So it, it was the point was that the, the, rather than the British building their own missile, which they didn't want to do, they leased the U.S. missile to put in their submarines. And it, so it, it, it's, it's kind of an artifice to say that, uh, you know, it, and, and it, if it would have been a tactical program, they would have co-produced it or we would have sold them to them or something. But this was this had to do with a lot of agreements the way we had, even some of the arms control agreements. It was kind of an artifice. Although in the arms control negotiations with the, the Soviet Union, they always counted the British missiles, but not the French, as part of the U.S. force. So 
So in some sense, they were accounted for in those numbers, so they would always add the British force. The British didn't like that, but, you know, the, the, the fact that they were our missiles, and, you know, that presumably they would fire them if we asked them to. Yes, right. It's, <laughs> if, if, they, if you use it, then you, then you have to pay us for don't return it. What was the, 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 the third question? Oh, <laughs> Uh, well, well, actually, they did try. I mean, they uh, they had GPS jammers, but they didn't have any way to launch anything in, in space. So it, uh, uh, but they did actually buy and tried to use a number of GPS jammers, but uh, uh, it was a fairly unsophisticated jamming system that was not effective. And, and, and it's actually, it's not a it's not a it's not an easy thing to do because I mean, although uh, we all have this point that the uh, if you have a, a System that is distributed as is, uh, that then it takes uh, a serious effort to uh, to take it down and GPS is that kind of yeah, system. GPS it's at a high altitude as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's at high altitude. But there's, there's, let me just comment that there's a couple of factors involved with uh, Iraq. Firstly, um, it's sort of on the borderline as to whether it has a technological capability. I'm, I'm saying easy on <laughs> with it's a relative statement. I mean, for Britain because they would buy it. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> right. Um, not under my regime, they wouldn't. Um, so uh, the the uh, the this, the uh, yeah. So they're, they're not that easy. And, and and basically, there's about 20 countries that have missile capabilities that would be the central essence of a s system to do an ASAP. Iraq is sort of on the borderline of one of those countries. It's not quite got that. Suborbital launch capability, basically the, the, the missile to get you up there. And whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, 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 yeah. So, so for different systems, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but one also has to remember that, that you know, um, uh, there's different levels of. I mean, there's not that many people in Saddam Hussein's tight regime that. I understand the basics of space probably, you know, I mean, it's just like a limited number of people in the decision loop that, that have any competence associated with this. I, I, I think it's just a very, you know, it, yeah, no, but I mean, I, I, you know, Stanford's got more chance of, of, of launching an ASAT than, than Iraq, in my opinion. I mean, you know, it's just like a concentration of, of people that have got enough education. A Caltech for sure. Yeah. Um, Even the University of Alabama at Huntsville could probably. <laughs> um, I have a question about uh, international trade in weapons and weapon systems. Um, I once heard a, a talk a couple years ago by George Schultz, and he prefaced his talk with a little blurb about how important free trade was in general, and then gave a very nice talk on his, his work on arms, uh, on nuclear. Uh, nuclear proliferation work, and it struck me there was a little bit of a an ironic tension between those two parts of his talk. And when I asked him about it, he he didn't seem to have a clear answer. My, my question to you guys is: Is there some line between ordinary weapons of small amounts of disruption and and big weapons where you where free trade is not allowed or trade in general shouldn't happen? Uh, well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting question, but I think eventually uh, the, the the point is that the uh, certainly the free trade uh, creates a, a lot of problem uh, in the uh, for 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 non-proliferation regime, and we we've seen the AQCon network when they uh, the they were able to order some parts in Malaysia and ship them, so that that creates a uh, creates a problem, but I don't think that that. In itself, it creates uh, the uh, situation in which countries would want to uh, buy or or even want to own uh, nuclear weapons, uh, and so I think in, on the it, it certainly it's harder to manage. But uh, I think the net benefit is uh, with the with the free trade because once you start the uh, free trade development. Uh, then you just undermine the incentives for countries to have nuclear weapons, and that's the most important part of it. Yeah, I think you know the the attempt has been to to ban trade in strategic weapons, and then allow it in sort of things that are that are 
that are not strategic as to use that. I mean, it's very hard to make that line, and in fact, I think we've overdone that quite badly in space. I mean, in fact, ITAR defines all space technology as weapons, and I think that's a very counterproductive effort. So you have to be very careful on that. On the other extreme, of course, you know that you can't really call them strategic and tactical. I mean, I, I, I remember in the '60s the army being aided and abetted by Livermore uh, was going to develop a nuclear hand grenade. I mean, I don't know where you would use this, but uh, <laughs> a pretty good you know, you, you have to have a very good arm, you know. The, uh, the uh, but uh, you know, I mean, there's there's obviously when you start getting into into things like that, it's it gets kind of dangerous, and you know, and and and, and uh, but but I mean, on the uh, the other weapon that is that is, uh, you know, the two weapons today that are are, are great concern are going to be very hard to control. One is biological weapons, as you do. Uh, you know, eventually artificial biology, but also genetic uh, capability that you know is, is fairly uh, uh, easy to do. The other one, of course, is computer attacks and so on. And those make it very clear. I mean, it, it, we can't stop all trade in those. But I mean, I the the issue is it's bad enough when kids in the basement make computer viruses. When they make real viruses, it's going to be even worse. So I, you know, it, it, it's a uh, those are areas that cause me a lot more concern than the nuclear and space things right now, which are fairly easy to to at least deal with. I mean, it's I, I think you know Will's point was that that it, it takes a rather sophisticated group of people, and it's kind of hard to buy it to build satellites and launch vehicles and nuclear weapons. So it's it's a different issue. I mean, unlike the movies, it, you know, it's real hard to make a nuclear weapon. And besides what Will says, it's hard to make satellites, too, as he's finding out. Uh, question for Pete and Will. Uh, much of the discussion about space, situational awareness, the weapons in space, space control, et cetera, is, uh, seems to relate to uh, nation states. In today's world, we're most particularly worried, I think, about actions by terrorist groups, um, which would mean what kind of access. My question is, what kind of access do they have? Or, what are the powers that be worried about as it relates to terrorists and uh, space security? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, terrorists in general don't have much access to space stuff, but some of the simpler vulnerabilities can certainly be exploited by terrorists. And, and we've seen radio jamming by terrorist groups, or like or at least from the Chinese government perspective, Fulong Gong is a terrorist group, and they, they jammed a satellite broadcast of something. I can't remember what it was in particular, but so... Groups of people that are loosely organized like terrorist groups can uh, can certainly interfere at that level. Um, but that doesn't tend to cause permanent damage or anything that's long-lived, basically, to uh, satellite systems. Uh, and it's hard uh, press for me to think of ways in which they would do it. Um, say, potentially laser ASAT stuff would be within the realm of possibility. Pete and I sort of disagree on exactly how hard that is. Um, he's probably thought about it more than me. So. But um, I... I you know, I don't think it's that difficult, and certainly in the realm of possibility for those sort of people. But again, like I, I'm not trying to. It, it is about concentration of minds, ultimately, all of these things. And and the reason I say Stanford, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that's, that that makes, uh, you know, I, I'm saying by the fact that it's Stanford can do some of these things is that it makes it may, it means to me it's simple. But because, but that doesn't mean. I mean, no, <laughs> let me rephrase. Uh, it means that you know a small group of well-educated people can do it. But but actually, a lot of these organizations don't have that. No, I mean, how many have a few dozen physicists that are uh, trained in laser stuff? Not many at all. Because if you're interested in that stuff, you can't get an education there. So you either don't get an education or you move. So I mean, those people don't. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, they don't have much access to that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I like to underscore that. It, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to mount what we might call an anti-satellite attack uh, requires a lot of sophisticated technical thinking. And, and quite frankly, you know, terrorists, uh, they may have some sophisticated technical people, but, uh, you know, most of them believe the last word in truth was written in the 7th century. So, you know, there's a little bit of a concern that it's hard to build spacecraft with that technology. Uh, but conversely, they tend to adapt to things they can find and, and use. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the threats that we really have to worry about from terrorists are really cyber threats and uh, uh, potentially biological threats. 
uh, in the space area, the, uh, you know, I think protecting our satellites, control systems and so on is, is probably much more important than, than, than protecting things. The other one, of course, is, and I know the Department of Defense has done a lot of work on this, is, is uh, in the past we had just a small handful of very vulnerable uh, uh, control facilities. And, you know, for example, it used to be all of the spy satellites the U.S. had were flown out of this little blue cube over here. Uh, you know, that we could drive by on the freeway and throw a satchel charge over the fence and take care of it. Now, that's been fixed now. I mean, the, so there's a distributed set of systems and multiple redundancies and so on, so you don't have that anymore. So that's really the, the I think the answer to it is, you know, it, it is unlikely that that terrorists are going to, you know, build a satellite and launch it and go out and do something. I mean, that's not impossible, but, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to stealthily you know, acquire a large booster and do a countdown on it and, and so on and so forth and do the command and control. And, I mean, even NASA couldn't rendezvous with a satellite here when we tried. So to, to follow up on that, actually, I was, in, we'll talk about rational actors and, and your, a lot of your arguments here are about the difficulty of access to space, but we are moving into a regime where it's going to become a lot easier, aren't we, over the next couple of decades. And my question, therefore, given that that will happen and that not all actors will necessarily be rational, what's the best way forward in terms of security? Is it like we were saying, it's, uh, it's international treaties or are there some other options? Well, I, I, on this, I tend to really agree with Will that, uh, that some sort of traffic agreements uh, backed up by multiple abilities to, uh, to know what's going on in space uh, so you can, you know, you know, again, what stops people from drunk driving? It's the fact that we have laws that we've agreed to, and that we have, you know, people that watch, and and then ultimately maybe means to to uh, uh, to stop things. And uh, uh, so I think those kind of things that his list, I very strongly support, is something you ought to do. That start with that, and I think it's going to happen. Uh, the uh, and yes, in 20 or 30 or 40 years, when you know you have a lot of private sector people being on the moon and other places, uh, we're we're going to have to have some sort of you know of, of rule of law and ability to enforce that. And uh, I would suspect that's where the, the the these various countries' military forces, just like we're working together now to stop piracy, uh, is a is going to happen. Yeah, I have just a follow up on that. I mean, I, I largely agree. Uh, but um, one of the interesting things about space domain is that, uh, um, um, uh, compared with other domains, is that uh, is this this ability to affect ev to ruin everyone else's day with your action. So you know, when you go out and um, murder someone here, although that can be really unfortunate for the person you murder, um, it doesn't generally affect everyone else. Or you know, if you crash your car. You know, it might take uh, an hour to get it off the road and to get ever out of everyone's way, and then everything's running smoothly again um, because we can move debris. <laughs> in, uh, so, in in the case of space, uh, we have an issue that we don't know how to remove it yet in an economically efficient way, as we were discussing based on an earlier question, and um, and, that, and and that means that I think that means that we have to be a little bit more preemptive in some of these rules because. You can't wait until the traffic gets too bad before you have the rule because the traffic will then be there permanently. <laughs> and that's not a good thing. Um, so uh, I, I, I suppose my only yeah, caution on it is that I think we have to think ahead a little bit more with space, at least in the, until some smart person comes up with an economically efficient way of removing debris, which is conceivably, you know, has these long term consequences. Uh, a couple of things. The uh, Soviet or the Russian rods from God's rods from God uh, program or testing that you had alluded to. Uh, the uh, second, anything to do with uh, the current status of uh, neutron bombs, which were prevalent in the 70s. And then the last thing is um, the answer to the question was lend least during World War II before our involvement, official involvement in the world. I wasn't aware of a, well, uh, any real 
concentrated effort on the part of the Soviets on rods from God. I mean, I was really referring to a U.S. effort. Uh, we never tested anything. There was a lot of technology development work uh, that we were doing. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 so I, it, it's important to say that. I mean, I'm sure there was similar analysis done in the uh, Soviet Union. But let me, let me ask you the last one. Yeah. Uh, well, a neutron bomb, I think there, there, I, I don't know any, any kind of a program like that, whether in the United States and, or in Russia. I don't think that's uh, something. On the, on the, uh, kind of a Soviet, uh, program, it, it wasn't rods from God. It was this, uh, this, uh, laser, it, it basically a battle station in space, which was, which was actually a very interesting project. Uh, and it was not the, the, the thing that actually, uh, was launched into space. It was lost because of software error. Uh, was not a functional uh, kind of a satellite. It was a prototype, uh, but it did have uh, on board a few uh, systems that were supposed to, uh, I mean, there was uh, initially, the, the idea was to release balloons to track them with uh, laser uh, rangers, with the radar uh, rangers. Uh, there, was, uh, <clears throat> there was an experiment there that would test uh, uh, the uh, exhaust system for a gas dynamic laser on 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 the on this kind of satellite. So it was actually a fairly advanced program. And uh, back to uh, to that that the, the, our uh, our argument that in fact, if you look at the, the Soviet Union, actually uh, did uh, got into uh, some efforts to build weapons in space. And in fact, it got fairly far. I mean. Uh, the, by the uh, by, the late '80s, when when the, it was it wasn't it wasn't necessary anymore. But by the late '80s, there were uh, a few programs. ASAT, in particular, there was a program uh, for w that was tested and actually tried. Uh, there was a program to uh, uh, deploy those kill vehicles on uh, those SS-19 um, uh, missiles. They they were thinking they were. I remember they they were thinking about using them against actually SDI uh, satellites, uh, and I remember uh, I had this conversation with one of the uh, general designers of uh, those systems, and and I asked so what you so you would have just started shooting things down? And he said, yeah, why not? I mean, we, we were like, <laughs> so I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, there, there were, there was a program there. I mean, some of that actually is still around, but, uh, that's, uh, that, that was real. I, I might have been in that thing, weighed something like 110 or 120 oh. tons. This is about half the mass of the International Space Station. It launched one on one moon. Of the first launch of the Energia rocket, which then the second launch was the Buran shuttle, basically a copy of the shuttle, a very sort of upgraded in the LST way, which was kind of cool. But unfortunately, it was the only ever launch of that Buran system. But the first launch was a huge military payload. <laughs> it was just a 120 ton system. <laughs> what was your question on Len Lee, sir? Oh, yeah, with the British, yes. Yeah. Well, if you'll uh, join me in... Uh, I want to say one thing before you, you wrap it up. It, just on behalf of the City Institute, I want to say thanks to our panel. You, you've you actually um, helped us explore the one of the factors of the Drake Equation, which is uh, something we founded the SETI Institute uh, uh, around, and, of course, the factor L, the longevity of a communicating <laughs> civilization, <laughs> Uh, uh, has a lot of dependency on what we talked about today. So uh, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I, I want to say thank you, and then I'll turn it over to, to uh, Adrian to close out the program. Well, if you'll join me, ladies and gentlemen, in thanking your panel for the, the great input.